So good morning, good evening, good late night, depending on where you are. As you may have noticed, last week we started with a new format. We, instead of giving you the whole introduction to the channel, we uh, start earlier on our main content, and that gets, gives us a chance to get deeper into the uh, Q&A uh, earlier as well. Speaking of q and I'm going to go into that, uh, do a quick Q&A this morning because it helps us focus on uh, a new item. Uh, we're having an event. I'll tell you about that in just a minute, the Tampa St. Pete event. Before I do, though, um, the major content for today is what your doctor won't tell you about calcified plaque. Um, uh, a warning, a geek warning. We may get a little bit geeky in terms of discussion about calcified plaque today. Jesus has promised, though, that he's going to keep it simple. We'll see if Jesus can actually do that. It can be a challenge, but it's the, the keep it simple challenge for today. We will get uh, deep into the science, though, because it is important in terms of calcification and stability. But as I mentioned before, uh, one of our viewers brought up an interesting point that it is already happening. It's already starting to, uh, uh, if you've got any uh, fear of missing out, you might want to go ahead and, and check this out. So we are doing an event. People have seen the events as a great way to jumpstart their uh, journey into a much better health situation. It's a two-day immersion. Uh, we've had them before. We've had a couple of them in Orlando. We had uh, one in Louisville. We had one planned in March of 2020, right when COVID happened and everything shut down. And we've been so busy uh, accommodating the growth and improving our quality and our services that we haven't been able to get to one uh, since then, since the Louisville event. So now we're able to do it. It's going to be December 3rd, 4th, and 5th, I believe, just that first weekend in December in Tampa, St. Pete. Uh, right here. Uh, we're hearing a little bit of background uh, noise there. It's in a great area. And let me tell you a little bit more, give you a little bit more update about it, if I can. <clears throat> Again, it's a two-day immersion journey into upgrading your health. First, it starts when you register, uh, the team will send you labs. So there's a, a full evaluation that's uh, of your metabolic health that's involved in a part of this process. As I mentioned, uh, if you wanna get a discount, we do have some early birds. Um, I don't know how many are left at this point, but <clears throat> the evaluation uh, is, you, you get an evaluation of your metabolic health and your labs when you're there at the, the event. I'll be staying afterwards to do a more of a, a full in-person uh, evaluation for those that want to do that. Uh, you know how CIMTs are difficult to get done? Yep, we're going to do those there. Um, the results for the CIMT, so it's not just that you're getting your CIMT, you're also gonna get the results from the radiologist who understands how to do this. And then again, interpretation from us um, of the technical jargon that you might hear from the radiologist. Now, one of the bigger uh, events is in the past has been very simple. It's been looking at uh, finger stick. You know, we all do some finger stick exercises in terms of understanding things. And about 20%, as usual, of us will have dawn effect. Uh, a lot of people will not understand that, and, but we'll all see that with ourselves and with each other. Now we're in a new era and we're working on developing a CGM as well to go with that. So CGM is a big deal. For those of you who are not familiar with it, it's continuous glucose monitoring, and we're looking at getting those monitors. Uh, CGM is sort of like um, 
the analogy I think is like uh, us having lived for 50 or 60 years, depending on how old you are, but uh, never having a speedometer. Now you have a speedometer and it is very, very telling. So as you can see, it is a major group health activity. There's a lot of group components, but there's a lot of private individual components where you can learn and see your own metabolic health um, in person with folks that understand what this is. Uh, so again, if you want to jumpstart that journey, uh, go ahead. Uh, and if you want to get the early bird discount, you might want to go ahead and give the folks a call. Uh, now, <clears throat> what I had wanted to, why that, what I wanted to cover is that we're all, like I said, we're already getting interest in this area. Uh, Bambi Grage, who's been a viewer for a long time, said, I wish you could have picked a more convenient city to have your event. How about Salt Lake City, Denver? Somewhere in the middle next time, please. Well, uh, Bambi, I don't know right now when the next time will be. Uh, there's some internal discussion about having at least one of them in the future in, uh, uh, in maybe the Caribbean. But the bottom line is we know we're having this one. We don't know when we're gonna have the next one. For some logistical reasons, it had to be Tampa St. Pete. And uh, that's the best that we can do right now. There's only so much we can do in terms of uh, expanding our resources to meet the demand because we're not going to expand beyond our ability to provide quality. Um, hey, Sus, anything else on that, that topic before we get into the... Um, the main topic for today. Yes. Uh, can you hear me there? Okay. Yes, I can see you. Uh, and can you hear me? I can hear you. And by the way, I forgot to make a comment. Your hair looks better today. <laughs> I, I, I think you, uh, I, I'll say that I got inspiration from you. So <laughs> before you confuse me for, for background noise, uh, let me ask you to, if you can repeat to it so everyone knows um, when the event is being held, where and where they should be calling, uh, just for, for so we are able to provide this information in another video. Oh, that's a good point. Thank you. Again, I tend to focus so much on, sometimes it's hard to get out of my head and start thinking about what uh, other people are thinking and wanting to know. Um, and you know, that's a challenge too. Um, so it's, uh, the, our event will be in Tampa, St. Pete in Florida, St. Petersburg, Marriott, Clearwater. It's on Roosevelt Boulevard. If you're, you know, if you know the space very well now where you call, um, Gilbert, if you'll show the number for the office, the 859-721-1414. So, Jesus, do you think that that gives them, gives folks what they're thinking about, what they need? Can you, can you mention the date on your own voice? It's going to be uh, way better than mine. This, uh, Friday, December 1st, Saturday, the 2nd. December 2nd. So Friday, the December 1st, Saturday, December 2nd. And thanks. I thought I had said that, but you're right. I didn't. Thanks for the coaching. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, teaching a YouTuber how to do YouTube. How's that? That's right. There you go. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't do. We don't do promotion that often, so it makes sense. We don't, and just uh, it brings up the point. We are looking to upgrade our act, improve our perspectives in terms of the channel, uh, as well as our quality stuff. We've been focused, especially over the past few months, on improving our ability to provide good quality for uh, folks in the patient area. But every it's about 80% of the new patients that come in all say the same thing. You know what? You helped me save my life just from reviewing the channel. So the channel is critical to us. Uh, we're saving probably more lives in the channel than even in the uh, the clinical space. So we've brought a, a couple of we've brought an expert on who will help us in a couple of different places. 
Give us time, though. Again, it's all about quality. And as you can tell, as Jesus is pointing out, I wasn't brought up and trained to be a YouTuber. I just sort of stumbled through. Yeah, like all YouTubers YouTuber did at the beginning. So it's that's just the way it is. So, yeah, join us. It's going to be a great event. Um, you're going to see and learn a lot. And hopefully if this event goes well, we can, that's going to motivate us to do more. Yeah. In other places. Yeah. But I think a lot of that depends on, uh, you know, as we're starting to see the increase in interest already, I don't think that's going to be an issue. I think maybe one of the bigger issues for folks watching is, you know, whether or not they can get that early bird discount, but we'll see. Yep. Good. So we're ready to move to the main topic. 20 Take minutes away. earlier than Just what we do. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to start as soon as possible, but I think you have something else that you want to add. No, I was just going to say, take it away about calcified plaque. But before I say that, we're continuing to demonstrate our need to improve our, <laughs> <laughs> our YouTube broadcast abilities. What are you talking about? I think we 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 make a great team. <laughs> we are in line and we complement our sentences. So what are you talking about? <laughs> Gilbert is the away. one who, who is waiting for us. Your doctor hasn't told you yet. And well, since since I've got the floor, since I've interrupted you, you know, one of the things that People think, well, maybe that's just sort of a, a, a clickbait, what your doctor hasn't told you. No, this is, if we've, I know I say this a lot too. If I've said this once, I've said it a thousand times. If I've heard this once, I've heard it a thousand times. People think that increasing calcium is always a bad thing. And it's not. We're not the only people that are saying this. The, as Jesus presents some of the science behind this space today, what you'll end up seeing is the guys that do the research in CT angiogram, calcium scores, they understand this as well. As usual, it's just not getting to the frontline doctors. They're just trying to get their work done, and they're not really understanding the science. Um, it would be great if we could depend on our doctors to know everything they need to know uh, about your health. But unfortunately, we just can't right now. Things will change. Things will continue to improve. But I'm a boomer, and the boomer generation just doesn't have another 20 years to wait uh, for, for this generation of doctors to understand. The biggest example is uh, how to diagnose the biggest cause of death, disability, uh, erectile dysfunction, Alzheimer's, stroke, kidney disease, kidney failure and blindness, meaning insulin resistance, prediabetes and diabetes. It's really clear. Three quarters of doctors don't know how to diagnose this, let alone manage it. Well, guess what? It's a lot more than three quarters of doctors don't know what we're going to be talking about today in terms of calcified plaque. So, whether you like it or not, if you want to maximize your health span, you're going to have to learn some of this yourself. And, you know, the fact that you're turning, tuning in and listening makes a strong statement about your willingness to do that. We certainly appreciate it. And we're going to try to make our presentation skills a little bit better so it's not so hard to sift through and figure out what we're trying to say. Hey, Sus, why don't you get started in terms of uh, the evidence here? Sure. So, Gilbert, if you can give us a water bowl. We were discussing about keeping or lifting away the water bowl. We can talk about that in the future. But for today what your doctor won't tell you about calcified blood. So first slide, it's to discuss the calcium paradox. So if you are having a calcium score 
which is a CT scan that will give you a number of how much calcium you have on your coronary arteries on your heart. The basic explanation they will tell you is the higher the score, the higher the risk. But that that's not necessarily true. So if you read between these lines, by stabilizing plaque, there is a reduction of risk of subsequent events. However, the rate of progression of calcium score increases due to accumulation of calcified plaque density. So the more calcified plaque you have, the higher the score will be. Uh, this is from the Cleveland Clinic. There is an article uh, where they are saying that even President Trump's calcium score is providing information for us to understand. Uh, President Trump's calcium score rose from 34 in 2009 to 133 in 2018. Now, is this higher risk or not? Well, it depends. Are your behaviors contributing to increased risk of heart attack? Are you still on the SAT diet? SAT meaning SAT or, and also meaning standard American diet. Are you still not exercising? Are you still dealing with diabetes, pre-diabetes, high blood pressure? If that's the case, yes, probably a high calcium score, it's a higher risk. But if you're not, uh, think about the calcium score like an iceberg. It's not the tip of the iceberg that is the issue. It's what is underneath that you can see. So the more calcified plaque, it also means that there is probably a lot of soft plaque down there that the CT scan is not catching. And that is the plaque that can rupture and cause a heart attack. So think about calcified plaque as a scar of previous soft plaque that is, is probably right there and it's not being treated. When you are on a low carb diet, when you're exercising, doing HIIT, controlling your diabetes and insulin resistance, you are contributing to stabilize that soft plaque. The calcium score, it's probably going to increase because of that, but you know that you're working on making sure that there is not soft plaque down there, that all the soft plaque you have has become calcified. Now, Dr. Brewer, I'll let you go ahead and uh, add, correct, or translate. <laughs> Either of those, one of those three. <laughs> hey, Asus has gotten pretty good at understanding when uh, I'll say, now let me repeat what he said. And he's, he laughs and says, and, and he's translating. It's not so much translating. It, it, you know, whether, whether there's an accent or not, uh, we were talking about this before the, the video. Uh, you can say one thing to an audience of just 10 people and all of them are uh, primary English speakers, you can get 12 different interpretations of what was just said. So it's helpful to go ahead and give another interpretation of something. Hey, Jesus also likes to give me a hard time about spilling the beans, uh, saying something before he's ready for it to be said. And I'm getting ready to do that too, spoiler alert. At some point in this, uh, in this presentation, Jesus is going to say the stand the, the standard expectation for soft versus calcified plaque is a ratio of four to one. In other words, for every one unit of calcified plaque, the standard is to expect four units of soft plaque. Now, why is that important? Well, think about it. If you're if uh, improving your health results in calcification of that soft plaque. It's just a natural part of the healing process of soft plaque. Then we've got two different things that can increase your calcification and therefore your calcium score. One is if you're continuing to eat really ba badly, you're uh, health behaviors are not good, you're not sleeping well, you've got stress, you're not exercising, then you're probably adding more soft plaque and yes, some more calcification, but still in a ratio of four to one. 
On the other hand, if you're like one of these, you know, a typical patient that has come to see me, they're beginning to understand this piece. They're starting to uh, change their health behavior. They're losing 30, 40, the 30 or 40 pounds they need to lose. I mean, just countless number of patients that are doing this. And then, though, you step back and you say, well, I came to, to get started on this. What really motivated me was I had a high calcium score. I've lost 30 pounds. Uh, we've Doors had to take me off of blood pressure medicines because my blood pressure's back. Uh, it's getting too low on the medications. Uh, I'm going to go back and get another calcium score. Kaboom, the calcium score has actually gone up. It isn't that you, you've added a lot more plaque. It's that you've taken that four to one soft plaque and started calcifying it. So, Jesus, how did I do in terms of stealing your thunder this time? You did it really good. So <laughs> I'm, providing, I'm providing just mumbling words, trying to get into the fact that calcified plaque is stable. And you just did that in a, with a really good history and the last time. So <laughs> the YouTuber is showing that he's a good YouTuber. He <laughs> doesn't need my coaching in any, in any sense in that aspect. <laughs> no, really good, really good. <laughs> so I hope that's clear enough. It's part of the calcium paradox. People think that if they're doing the right thing, the calcium is going to go down. It's very likely going to go up just because you are stabilizing your plaque. So now there is this thing about, well, are you sure that calcified plaque is stable and it, that is safe? Uh, there's something that we call natural history of disease. In this case, natural history of cardiovascular disease, heart disease. And the natural history is that soft plaque is going to calcify, whether you like it or not. However, uh, on a natural, on, on a normal basis, it's not going to happen that often unless you do the work, change your lifestyle to stabilize as much as soft plaque as possible. So in this study, they wanted to verify how dangerous is actually calcified plaque, right? Is it the amount of plaque, the volume of plaque that is the issue that is blocking the blood flow through the heart? Or is the amount of soft and calcified plaque that, 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 that there is in there, which is actually causing the issue? In this case, they did not use a calcium score. They used a CT angiogram, which is also a CT scan, a computer tomography scan, but they are using a contrast, a radiological contrast to view the arteries on, on the coronary arteries. They came up with two terms. One is plaque volume, calcified plaque volume, meaning how much plaque is there on one artery. And the other one is percent of calcified plaque. So when you think about calcified plaque, it is not necessarily 100% calcified. Part of that plaque can still have some soft plaque on it or being on a mixture of both. Some soft plaque, some calcified plaque. It's, it's not that hard as you might think on the side of consistency of the plaque. So they say, okay, if you have a lot of volume of plaque, calcified plaque, yes, there's a three times more risk of cardiac events. But apparently it's not so much about how much plaque you have. If you see the, the, the bottom, uh, the last bullet, percent calcified plaque, meaning from that plaque, how much is actually calcified? The more calcified plaque, actually hard calcified, stable plaque, the less risk of heart attacks you will have. And then now Dr. Brewer is going to come up with what Jesus tried to say is. <laughs> so what he was saying is this, you know, here's the big, the big conundrum, the big confusion. What, uh, I, and in fact, the big irony, it's very ironic. You hear it time and time and time again. The higher your calcium score, the bigger your risk for heart attack. So no wonder the patient that comes in, loses 30 pounds, gets off blood pressure medicine, you know, their metabolic health just 
improves dramatically, their calcium score goes way up. So here's the irony. I mean, that's why so many people get confused. It's in the, the third and fourth bullets on what Jesus just presented in terms of the science and the evidence. Yes, the high volume of calcification is a risk. But it's not a risk in, inherently in of itself. The calcium, the, the calcium is not causing the risk. It's a biomarker. And here's where the irony comes in. It depends on the reason for the increase in calcium. We said that in the last slide. We said, look, it depends on your ratio of uh, calcified to non-calcified plaque. It really depends on how much non-calcified plaque you have. And again, we've said this multiple times. You think, well, you know, these guys are just one, one group on the, on the uh, YouTube, on the web saying this. You know, we're aware of what other people are talking about. Nobody's talking about this. And part of it's because they don't do CIMT. They don't understand it. Increased calcium is an increased risk. However, it's really only if your increased calcium is coming along with four times that much soft plaque. If your calcium is increasing because you're taking it out of that soft plaque, you're calcifying that soft plaque, then your risk is actually decreasing. Again, as we said, it's in that third and fourth bullet. Hey, Sus, I tried to say, re-say what you said and translate it. I'm not sure that it that good of a job. You did it better the last time. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one thing that, I, uh, to the point of, it's not just us. This is from the Journal of American College of Cardiologists. So even cardiologists are aware of this. What's the thing that I see in this article that I'm, I'm not, to uh, that I know I don't agree that much. They are saying high calcified plaque volume, but they are acknowledging that it's not all calcified. So why would you call it calcified plaque volume if it's not all calcified? That's the problem. So when you see a CT angiogram, a CTA, and the guys from Clearly who are doing uh, AI driven measurements, it can tell you as well how much of that plaque is actually calcified? Um, how, mu how, much, how much of that is non-calcified? And how much of that is soft plaque that they call low density plaque? Uh, so even if they are telling you here, high calcified plaque volume is three times more risk, they are acknowledging that is not 100% calcified plaque. There is some soft plaque in there. And that's what's conferring that risk. Correct. Soft plaque is unstable. Calcified plaque is stable. It's not going to rupture. It's not going to cause a clot. It's not going to cause a heart attack. So let me rephrase it maybe in terms of a question that might help. So if I'm the one of those guys that lost 30 pounds and it greatly improved my metabolic health, my calcium score goes way up. What, why, is, why is it that we say that my risk has actually gone down? Because we can measure how much soft plaque you have. And that okay. is, you can do with a CT angiogram. Uh, it's a little bit more invasive, but you can do that with a CIMT as well. Right. So to us, it's different to see a calcium score from, let's say, 300. For somebody who is overweight, obese, with diabetes, not making doing exercise, if we do a CIMT, if we do a CT angiogram, we are definitely going to find that bottom of the iceberg, a lot of soft plaque in there. We know that. Yeah. But if we are we are having somebody with the same calcium score of 300, who is lean, less body fat taking medication if necessary, controlling insulin resistance, diabetes, we are confident that if we do a CIMT or a CT angiogram, we are going to find little to no soft plaque. And that's why we know that the risk is lower, even if you have a high calcium score. 
So we're saying that we know it because we've seen it a thousand times, more, more than a thousand times. But you're also saying there's another reason that we know it, and that is because we're using a technology, CIMT, which actually measures it. That's the difference. You're also saying that there's a new kid on the block, CT angiogram, and specifically AI-driven CT angiogram, that one of the first ones coming out is, uh, with a brand name is Clearly, and it's starting to show that as well. You know, you could accuse us of being old school for doing CIMT. Uh, we're doing CT angiogram as well. The pro there's several problems with CT angiogram, and if you want us if you want to understand the differences between CT angiogram, AI-driven CT angiogram, and CIMT, I think uh, it's better to go back to the, the video that we did last week. If others have questions on it today, we can talk about it today. But we've got other content to cover. Is that a, a fair representation? Yes, we have a couple of videos about AI, C, C, uh, CTA, and uh, we are inviting also uh, Dr. Todd to come talk about CIMT and CTA. We have a, a lot of information on CIMT as well. We do believe CIMT is, even if it is harder to get, it's cheaper and it's uh, safer in the sense that it's not as invasive as the CTA and it's not going to take you to the preventive stent pathway. Yeah, uh, because so, even even if the test will depend on who is reviewing and interpreting, interpreting the test. Yeah. So uh, I'm starting to watch some of the comments, some of them talking about clearly CTA and the focus on those. It's really, pardon the pun, maybe pun intended. Uh, the research trends are clearly going towards <laughs> uh, AI driven CTA. I personally think that's unfortunate, and here's why. It's not because of the increased cost. It's not because of the increased invasiveness. It's because it starts taking you down that plumbing mode. If you're looking at the anatomy, you're saying, I bet I can go in and put a stent there. And stents don't prevent a heart attack. You'll also see a question in here. And pardon me for jumping ahead on some Q&A, but, you know, we do that. Uh, one of them is saying, uh, why can't you do or can you do a CTA uh, for a stent? Uh, maybe you can't do a calcium score. Maybe there's some other things you, you can't do if you have a stent. You can do, a, if I'm getting it correctly, and, and correct me if I'm not, Jesus, you can do... Uh, a CT angiogram with a stent, if it was one of the larger stents, if it's one of the smaller stents, it tends to confuse the uh, the, the echoes and the images. We can, uh, we can the, go the, ahead. What I know is, I don't, unless there's some intervention, interventional cardiologist over here that can give us, give us some light on that aspect, but what I know is that there's no contraindication for CT angiogram and for calcium score. It is for magnetic re magnetic uh, resonance imaging, MRI, because some stents have, have pieces of metal on it and the image can get blurry if you do an MRI if you are, and you already have a stent. But as, as far as I know, the CT angiogram, you can have it. It doesn't matter if you have a stent or not. Well, we'll have to do some fact checking on that. There's no question you can't do an MRI because it's magnetic and you're putting, you know, you're trying to take um, images with a magnetic of, of a place that's got metal in it. So, yep, yeah, it was Ricky the Gun 1 asking about why can't CT angiogram uh, or calcium score be done on someone with a stent. There was another comment I'm going to bring up in just a second when uh, when I find it. But what? Oh, I have to say this. I have to acknowledge. OK, Randy, I says you guys are not making this clear. Are you saying that once the soft plaque is gone and the calcium score rises, we are good now? How do we know the soft plaque isn't still there or coming back? You want to answer that, Jesus? You cannot rely on the calcium score to get that answer. That's why we're bringing up CIMT and CT angiogram as options to evaluate soft plaque. 
Yeah. And I, remember when I said I was going to make this simple, I know now I realize I failed miserably. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, we can beat up on ourselves, but uh, who's done a better job? I mean, it's like there's nothing out there that's explaining this issue because it is confusing. As Jesus pointed out, here's one simple fact. Calcium score only measures calcium. It does not measure soft plaque. And guess what? Soft plaque is what's dangerous. Calcium is not. When you know those two facts, that helps explain so much. Remember those two facts and then start putting them in, put everything else that we say in the context of calcified plaque is stable. The danger is in the non-calcified or soft plaque. Uh, I'm not going to go down the bunny hole of answering how do we know the soft plaque isn't still there coming coming back because it can come back if you fall off the wagon. This is a lifestyle related issue. Now I'm going to uh, let you get back to the. To yeah, the I, I, and we're going to talk about this, but you can put 30 stents on a soft plaque. If you don't change your lifestyle, that soft plaque is going to get repopulated. That stand is going to get repopulated with soft plaque. And you're going to be in the same place. And then you have uh, recurrent interventions and getting more stands for a bypass graft because there's a still soft plaque in there. So the main problem and the main concern we have with preventive stands is thinking that you are safe and that you can keep your poor health lifestyle just because you have a stand on you. That's not the case. Exactly. Now, well, this next study that you're getting ready to describe can help under, help us understand a little bit more about the differences between soft plaque and um, and calcified plaque. And you're also, I think you're also going to uh, cover a little bit of the Honda study as well. Is that right? Yes. So yes. these two studies will help us understand a lot more about, if you're sitting there saying, well, wait a minute, you keep talking about uh, calcified plaque being stable. How do we know that? Well, listen up. So this is from the Journal of American Medical Association. Uh, this is a, a randomized control study, uh, case control. They follow uh, these patients for 2.5 years. And they measured, uh, we, again, using CT angiogram to detect soft and calcified plaque and non-calcified plaque. And they identify a group of people who had more than 1,000 Hounsfield units. What's that? A Hounsfield unit is what radiologists use to measure cal calcium on the arteries. Uh, it's a density measurement. And just so, so you know- black is gonna have zero Hounsfield units. Exactly. And calcified- Stabilized black will have a thousand or more. Uh, uh, calcified starts from 350. Okay. Or more. So, so this is, Calcified, really calcified plaque on one. Right. Plaque, you know? So they saw that those folks who had plaque that reached the 1,000 household units, meaning very, very calcified, a lot of calcium, very, very stable plaque, had less low density plaque, had less soft plaque. So that's, that's what they're saying. If you don't have soft plaque, you're going to have calcified plaque. They have a lot of calcium because they calcified all that soft plaque that they had going on. Patients who suffered heart attacks had less 1K plaque, meaning they had less calcified plaque. So if you thought that by having a lot of calcified plaque, by having a very high calcium score, uh, that's going to cause a heart attack, Think again, in this case, people who had a lot of calcium on their arteries had less risk of a heart attack because they didn't have that much soft, unstable plaque. Care to translate? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was just going to look it up. There's a series of comedies that were done with uh, one of the uh, Obama. Uh, and the comedian, it was the comedian standing next to Obama. Obama would say something and the comedian would translate in terms of, have I you saw seen that? that? Yeah, it's really <laughs> funny. 
<laughs> this is starting to look like that. Uh, what I will say is this. Um, if, if you got a little bit confused uh, when Jesus was going over the Houndsville units thing and then got maybe even more confused when we were talking about the difference between a thousand Houndsville units, which is really stable, and then 350 or to 1,000, which is maybe not so stable. Don't worry, we will get deeper into that. Not in this video. Just we're going to, when uh, Jesus mentioned that we're going to have Todd come on, Todd's going to come on and the three of us will talk much more deeply about soft plaque, echogenic or hard plaque, which is a thousand hands failed units or more, and what's in between. Now, in Todd's uh, vernacular, the CIMT world, it's heterogeneous plaque. And that's if you've been a patient of us or if you've had a CIMT, that's what you've heard. In this world where they're looking at uh, CTA, you hear more uh, Hounsfield units and quite often you'll hear 350 to 1,000 Hounsfield units. But again, I'm, I'm getting into a future topic I'm going down a bunny hole. I'm just trying to say, if that left you a little bit confused, don't worry about it. A, you don't have to worry about it at all, but B, we're going to cover that a little bit more later on. Bottom line is what Jesus just said <laughs> was the people that had calcified plaque were not the people that had heart attacks. The people that had heart attacks were the ones that had non-calcified Soft plaque. So if you're asking that question, how do we know that calcified plaque is stable? This is how we know. And we're going to cover another study too. There are plenty of studies that show that calcified plaque doesn't have, is not a risk for heart attack. 90% of the risk is gone. And we looked at that in depth yesterday. It's really over 90% of the risk of soft plaque is gone by the time you calcify it. And you know, I today we're going to cover a lot of key studies that we always reference, but yes. we might want to cover the Cafe de Caves study. Uh, Ariana Feldberg mentioned that on, on the, the, the time she came in here because that's the one that provides a number about 89.3% of heart attacks prevented by doing a CIMT. So I think it's a good idea to cover that study as well. I agree. And, and what, what Jesus was saying was, um, <laughs> you got it. You now. see a lot of shorts with Ariana Feldberg. Ariana is a very passionate CIMT tech, also trained with Todd, does a lot of work with him, doing her own uh, group in terms of trying to provide more access to CIMT. And you've got a series of shorts with me and uh, Ariana. And that's what he's talking about. You'll hear her refer to soft plaque. You'll hear her refer to some of the concepts that we're talking about. Now, um, moving on, there's one question here. And I mean, if Dr. Burr does, does it, I can do it, right? So yeah, Harvey sure. Alex is saying, <laughs> as the soft plaque gets calcified, does the calcified plaque get more dense? that is heavier, but not taking up more space. So we had a discussion with a patient that we appreciate a lot. Uh, we appreciate a, a, a lot of uh, all of our patients, but this patient brought up something that we wanted to cover because there's not so much information on it. They say, okay, I understand that soft plaque is unstable, can cause a heart attack. But my case, I had a lot of calcified plaque so much calcified blood that was blocking my arteries. And I started to have chest pain, had, a, had angina, went to the hospital and they say, you know what, we have, we have to put a bypass on it. We have to open your chest, do open heart surgery because all that calcified blood is blocking the flow and you don't want that. So you're not having a heart attack, but your artery is just too clotted with calcified plaque, and we need to fix that. At some moment, they proposed a stent, and he went with the stent, and apparently the stent uh, relieved the angina symptoms, the pain on it. Um, 
but it, that's part of the discussion on should I have got the stand or not? Uh, how how high was was my risk? And part of that discussion brought up this slide right here, which is I think one of the more important that uh, ones that I, we wanted to share with you. Uh, there's a difference between a heart attack and something that we call obstructive coronary artery disease. So to your left side, what you're seeing, it's an uh, um, anatomical fragment of a vessel that from a person who died from a car attack. And what you can see there is right on the lumen, in the middle, uh, you have a thin yellow layer, which is the intima layer of the artery. You see a hole in there and a lot of uh, clot and uh, stuff right there. So this is somebody who had a heart attack. The inner layer broke. There was a lot of inflammation, lipid rich plaque in it. It ruptured. The body tried to fix it with a clot, but the clot ended up uh, screwing everything up. That's a heart attack. On the right side, what you're seeing is obstructive coronary disease. So there is plaque around the lumen. And as that plaque starts to be bigger and bigger and bigger, the space from where the blood should be flowing gets reduced. Uh, and that's not a heart attack, but the, the amount of blood that is going through the coronary artery is decreasing. I know you have thoughts on thoughts on this one, Dr. Brewer. How did you know? I, I can tell. I, I, I you shared with me this image, so <laughs> I know that you have your own explanation for this one. So, the the patient in me comes out when I'm listening to that, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, just just when we thought we were beginning to understand soft versus calcified or stable and hard plaque. Now you're heading down not one, but two other bunny holes, two other topics. One is this uh, slow obstruction versus a heart attack. And the second other bunny hole is angina versus heart attack. I guess I'm right, right? You're heading down new topics, right? Yes. Yes. And that part of saying... Uh... Well, your, Dr. Brew talks a lot about it's not the blood flow, it's not the blood flow, it's inflammation. But I got a stent because all I had was calcified plaque and I was having chest pain. So in this case, maybe it was the blood flow. Is that what you're saying? I, I, I want to hear. I'm putting you on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. And occasionally you'll get slow, chronic, obstructive disease. And this is, it's a totally different uh, animal from, uh, from a myocardial infarction. And I have avoided this, kind, this issue like the plague because it's what most people think that a heart attack is. Uh, maybe for, fortunately or unfortunately, that's rarely the case. You see a lot of this, but that's not what a heart attack is, just like Jesus said. Exactly. It's different. Oh. Now, now, how much risk do you have if you have obstructive coronary disease like the image to the right? So if you have 50% of less plaque, if you have 75% blockage or a 90% blockage, what is, what is the higher risk for a heart attack, Dr. Brewer? I, I know you know the answer for this one. So I'm not putting you on the spot on this one. <laughs> but you know what? You're getting ready to cover it, aren't you? <laughs> you just you just hit a switch uh, a reverse card on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to steal your thunder this time. Go ahead and, and show us what the well, rest. You're, you're gonna you're gonna have to correct me then. Uh, we have we have told this before. Two thirds of heart attacks happen when you have less than fifty percent blockage. So it's it's not just the blockage. Is what type of plaque do you have? So if you have 90% blockage because of soft plaque, I'll be surprised that you don't you haven't had a heart attack just yet. But if you're having 90% of blockage because of calcified stable plaque, I'm not concerned about a heart attack. I know it might cause chest pain, it might cause angina, it might cause 
reduce blood flow. And it's scary because if you don't know this information, any chest pain seems like a heart attack. Yeah. So that's my answer right there. I didn't have another reverse card for you, so I had to take it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, speaking of trying to, to follow the questions that are in turn following us, you know, I, I see in here some of the frustration. Um, and part of the frustration is, wait a minute, that, uh, that's what I was trying to ask earlier. What's worse, soft plaque that's now calcified and is blocking more flow or tip of the iceberg situation where soft plaque might break off? Look, we'll, we'll answer that. And in fact, Jesus just did answer that. But let me just make one other comment. In, in our defense, yes, some of these things are very uh, can be very ironic and complicated, and they can be the opposite of what um, logic takes you to, common logic. Common sense is all, often not common and is often um, can be deceptive. Uh, the other thing is this stuff can be complicated. It's like that scene in the the diary or the book or whatever that that uh, movie yeah, was. The diary. If you're, if you're gonna see that movie, I'm sorry. If you're gonna see that movie, see it because of what Doctor Bruce about to say next, not because of the toxic relationship they had. <laughs> Keep going. I'm sorry. I I had to say it. <laughs> Speaking of toxic relationships, many of us have toxic relationships with reality. The bottom line is reality can be complicated. It just can. And we are doing our very best to um, to bring at least a little bit of clarity to this. And you know what? You could say, dang it, this is so confusing to heck with it. I'm not sure these guys are helping. I'm going to move off. And a lot of people will do that. But remember, if you make that choice, this, uh, you know, I know I sound like a scratch record, but it's reality. This is the number one thing that's going to kill you, that's going to permanently disable you through stroke or Alzheimer's, and you know where the rest of that litany is going. And your doctor's not going to be able to uh, to clarify this for you and to do what you need to do. That's already been shown. So if you want to maximize your health span, you're going to have to... Uh, do the work. And there's a heck of a lot of people doing the work. Uh, the fact that we've got so many people that come on this show and say, yeah, I did it. I did it from your videos alone. Or people that come on and say, yeah, I was your patient. I did it. We, I, I'm comfortable. I am where I need to be. I've added 30 years back that I lost on my health span. It can be done. Just hang in there. So back to your question again, Randy A. What, that's what I tried to ask earlier. What's worse, soft plaque that is now calcified and is blocking more flow or tip of the iceberg situation where the soft plaque might break off? If, in case you missed it, I am going to not, I'm going to say what Jesus said again, but I'm not translating it. He said it crystal, it was, he was crystal clear in what he said. Almost crystal clear. <laughs> Maybe you just didn't hear it with the flurry of other facts that, that were flying around and the, the complicated nature of reality. Jesus said it. At least 90% of coronary events, of heart attacks, of these major impacts on health are the one on the left. Soft plaque that... Uh, it doesn't break off. It causes a clot. So he, here's what's, well, I won't go down that bunny hole right now, but it's the soft plaque situation that's the dangerous one. The other one you're going to see over the next couple of slides is not nearly as dangerous as you might think. Definitely. So we're, we're, we're getting to the juicy part. So there's something called coronary chronic total occlusion, meaning somebody who has a lot of plaque has not developed a heart attack, but in the span of three months or more, there's just so much plaque that the blood cannot just cannot go through that vessel anymore. So the image to the right that you, that you see in there, what is showing is a coronary artery 
To the left, you will see the major artery that's receiving blood flow. Uh, the, image to the, 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 image, the image above says estenosis, which is a reduction in blood flow, something similar to what we saw on the previous slide, maybe 75, maybe 90%. And to the right, you see a lot of branches from that artery that are providing blood and nutrients to that part of your heart. When on the image below, when you develop a total occlusion of that, that doesn't happen from one day to the other. When that happens suddenly, that's usually because of a clot and that's what you call a heart attack. In this case, this is not a heart attack. This is plaque that was building up so much that obstructed the blood flow over time. And the body creates defense mechanisms for that, which we call collateral vessels. And you see a small line over there that is kind of a... Uh, um, what do you call that when you don't want, when you want to avoid traffic? Collateral. Is that what you call it? Like a short. Oh, oh, oh a detour. A detour. Yeah. Yeah. So a, a detour. Collateral artery is like a detour. Yeah. Granted, it's it is way way more um, not fragile, but it's, it's a smaller vessel. So you're not gonna have your usual blood flow on it. It's gonna be like thirty percent of your normal blood flow, but it's gonna be enough to keep your heart that part of your heart alive, receiving nutrients, receiving blood flow. This is not a heart attack. However, it can cause chest pain. It can cause angina. And if you're having a chest pain, especially what we call un unstable angina or uh, even a stable angina, uh, meaning I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that real quick. A stable angina or stable chest pain is you start having that pain on the center of your chest. Like somebody, like we, we say like an elephant is sitting down on your chest. You start lacking for, you you start struggling to breathe and it can um, send the pain to either your arms back or your jaw. But if you sit down, breathe and rest for a couple of minutes that the pain goes away. That's what we call stable angina. Unstable angina is when this pain is present even if you're not exercising or doing physical efforts. And if you're resting, the pain is still, it's still in there. And clinically, we don't have a way to distinguish a heart attack for unstable angina. We have to test. So people who have this can have a stable angina. They can have chest pain if they start walking, running, jogging, or exercising. And that's just because they have, they're having a decrease on the blood flow to that part of the heart. And it's not a heart attack. Now, the CT angiograms uh, can find up to 50% patients with one vessel dealing with this on people who have coronary artery disease, meaning uh, even half of patient who, patients who have coronary artery disease might have this. Bingo, that's why you have a lot of bypass grafts and stents. Now, what's the worst? If somebody has total occlusion, 95% of them will have symptoms. 95% will have chest pain. And if doctors don't know if that's a heart attack or not until we test, I can put, at the, I put myself on the place of the patient and say, I'm, I'm having chest pain, I might be having a heart attack. So they tell you a bypass, an open heart surgery, a stent is going to save your life. You say yes automatically. Now, mostly men, on men's, they, they are mostly, men's, men's who have this, they are mostly older, they have other cardiovascular risk factors, and we have found that patients who have peripheral arterial disease, meaning decreased blood flow on your legs, have higher risk for this one. Females are usually older, have hypertension and diabetes. But see here, up to 80% of patients with this will have collateral vessels, uh, detours for this issue. Patients with this total occlusion in a non-infarcted vessel, meaning no heart attack, and multiple vessels with plaque have decreased ventricular function, meaning the heart is not pumping blood to the rest of the body as it should. And it makes sense. If you have multiple vessels that have decreased blood flow, the heart 
is not going to be as strong as it used to be. You can say, wow. <laughs> or you can say, let me rephrase all of that. <laughs> so Dennis Wickersham, this is what Dr. Vega meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that joke, I don't think that joke is going to get old. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. So because because to, you know, Denny's uh, credit and a bunch of other people's credit, this is hard stuff. And yet they're hanging in there. But you know what? They know their life depends on it. Let me I'm actually going to cover instead of trying to reinterpret what you're saying, Jesus, I'm going to go back and uh, cover a couple of points which are looking at the same topic from maybe a slightly different perspective. Let me go back and say this. What Jesus is drawing here is the side image of this image on the right. So again, the vast majority of heart attacks are what you see on the left. It's that soft plaque creating the clot, which goes to the heart and blocks the vessel. That's different. That's an that's a acute uh, explosive type of event. It's not what most people think. Most people think that it's slowly clogging the drain. That's what Jesus went into. And that's on the right. This is where you're getting slowly clogging the drain. Now, another point I wanted to make is I talked with that patient Jesus yesterday, uh, yesterday evening, and he agreed to come on the show. So we're going to actually have him on the show um, he's going to talk, it's Fred. He's going to talk about, um, his case. And we're going to go a lot deeper into the concepts that you're presenting on this slide. So if you didn't pick up on what just happened, Jesus switched over into what most people think about in terms of a heart attack, which is not really a heart attack. A heart attack's acute. It's a clot. It's soft plaque. It's a an acute surprise event. It's not slowly clogging the drain like you see on the right. We're going to have a patient who's got this specific issue going on, and he's going to be coming in in a few weeks. Now, then what, uh, I am going to translate a little bit. Then when, when Jesus got into these facts, he what he's describing is the people that tend to have this problem, mostly men, older, higher cardiovascular risk, as demonstrated by things like peripheral disease, disease in your legs and stuff like that. Now, here's the other thing. You can't see my um, my cursor, can you, Jesus? I, I can't. I don't can know you? if there's a way over here to... No, that's okay. Can you take your cursor and point to the stenosis in the upper image? Can you see mine? Oops, we can't see yours. I don't think so. I think this is okay. a StrangeYard issue. Maybe maybe Gilbert can give us a um, pointer or something we can use. Uh, even if not, look at the upper image and the lower image. I'm going to go back and just repeat the traffic analogy. Assume you're on a, a major limited access superhighway and there's a wreck. The wreck, look at the arrow in the upper image. That is stenosis and that is this image on the right you're getting this uh closure of the um of the traffic what happens you find some place back prior to that it's a detour in the lower image look at the lower image you find that detour and you start going around it that's exactly what happens in this chronic total occlusion uh, process that Jesus, that bunny hole Jesus has gone, gone down with these two slides. So I'm going to leave it uh, at that in terms of not so much translating everything, but uh, trying to put some other aspects around it for those who may have gotten lost. And again, if you did get lost, don't worry too much about it. We're going to cover it again. Yeah, and, and just just so you're aware, maybe there there's some things that sometimes I like. We are we're medical professionals, so sometimes we kind of uh, assume people know what we're talking about on some things. Like the picture that we have from a heart attack 
the idea that we have from a heart attack can be very different to what people think about when they think about the heart attack. So when you think about the heart attack, that clot that is blocking the coronary artery, the issue is not the blockage itself. The issue is that all, all that blood is not getting to one part of your heart. And you think of your heart like being the size of your fist. And it has multiple vessels around it. So one vessel will feed this piece of your heart, this part right here. If you block the blood flow over here, this piece of your heart is going to die. And you only have the rest of your heart to try to compensate and contract to push blood through your body. If you block the artery up here, all that side of the heart is going to die. And if it's big enough, you're going to die because of a heart attack. That's why the LAD, the, the left anterior descending artery, is called the widowmaker. So in a heart attack, that happens all of a sudden. You have a rupture, you get a clot, and you develop a chest pain that you never had. On the coronary chronic total occlusion, when this happens over time, you might start feeling pain when exercising. It can start like, like mild pain. And it can increase over time. It's not going to be as sudden as with a heart attack. I hope that helps. Well, Jesus, Juan has, has, has jumped in the act here, too. He's translating for you now as well. I appreciate it. And <laughs> if his name is Juan, I'm assuming that he uh, is Spanish-speaking, probably. I'm assuming. I'm sorry. Probably a poor assumption. But I appreciate it. So, he, and he's got the message, 90% occlusion by hard plaque uh, is less risk of heart attack than 50% occlusion of soft plaque. Exactly right. Thank you so much, Juan. And stenting in the 90% occlusion should really only obey the symptoms. Uh, I think he's got a really good point there. Now, is this a correct statement? Yes and yes. However, there's a, there is a little bit of a complication there. When you look at it, so it brings up the question of the stents really. So we've already shown the Orbiter trial and the Courage trial uh, have shown that stents don't prevent these acute heart attacks. The thing on the left side, this, they don't pre prevent that. They might help with that. Now, uh, they might help with that. The point is the answer is might. Uh, the operative point is might. It's a, it's a research signal. It's not very clear, but they certainly don't help prevent these. So really good points, Juan. Thank you so much for covering them. Let me, let me uh, jump over and uh, make one other or, or let somebody else make one other comment. Rob, Robert Thompson is saying, you did answer my question about collateral circulation. Thank you. Will it show up on EKG and will it show up on troponin levels? Mm, those are markers for reduced blood flow and damage to the heart tissue. So the troponin on, this, on the total occlusion, not from a heart attack, probably yes, probably not. On a heart attack, yes, the troponin is going to rise. Yes. The EKG can be, become positive in either of those two. And that's the sole premise of the stress test. Yeah. So if you have a stress test and you have less, less of 50% occlusion, the stress test is not, is not going to get that. But if you are 75% occluded and you exercise, the blood flow uh, is not going to be enough to keep up with the heart uh, demands to keep working and increase its heart rate and effort. And uh, the stress test is going to get that on an EKG. Um, and that's why they say, oh, that's a positive stress test. You're going to have a heart attack because you have occlusion. So let's actually get back to that question of uh, you should stent for, uh, for this. Yeah. Should so you stent for this, Jesus? That's, that's the question that is still unanswered. I have my opinion. 
And I think it might be a little bit different from your opinion, but I wanted to provide the facts before we answer it. So this is a review from 2019. They included like eight, nine articles, uh, eight, or eight or nine studies that revealed this specific question about how do you treat uh, chronic total coronary occlusion? And the standard is usually using a bypass graft. And they saw some studies that suggest that patients that receive the stents show less mortality, less angina, less chest pain, less stroke, and less risk of cardiovascular events. However, from those eight studies, only one was a randomized controlled uh, trial, which is a higher power in evidence than the other ones. And that one study showed that there, were, there was no benefits of stents versus medical therapy for chest pain in this group of patients. So I, to me, at least according to this article, there is still debate. I think every patient is different. There's another article from the Corona Atherosclerosis Reports in 2019, and they compared which patient had the best result if they had this problem, not a heart attack, but occlusion to 100% in one vessel and chest pain. So compared with the stents, medical therapy was associated with higher all-cause mortality, cardiac mortality, and major adverse, adverse cardiac, cardiac events. There was no difference between rate of myocardial infarction, heart attack, or repeat revascularization procedures, meaning having a second stent or a bypass. Now, I will say, take this with a pinch of salt. They, they did a whisker plot right here. And if you see, you have, uh, th this is, this is another, this is a meta-analysis. So they, they assessed multiple studies looking for this specific question. Is it better a stent or medical therapy? One, two, three, four, five, six studies, seven studies favor medical therapy. One, two, three, four, five studies favor stents. So, is medical therapy enough? Probably not because you have other risk factors that can increase mortality. But what was made clear here is what that there was no difference between the risk of a heart attack is you had, if you had a stent or not. When you have one vessel completely occluded, 100% occlusion. Clear, is it, it was was it clear enough or <laughs> do you think we need to readjust some rephrasing something no i don't think i'm going to say what jesus meant to say but i am going to ask you a question go back actually yeah go ahead go ahead and ask uh, let me ask you a question you said ford i don't think you and i are going to have the same opinion what do you think my opinion is I, I think your opinion uh, was more on the side of this results right here on saying, even if you have a total occlusion, uh, I won't rush to get a stent right away. I would not rush to get a stent. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe I'm, I'm assuming again, I do a lot of assumptions, so. No, you and I talked about an hour about this yesterday, and I probably fell there, <laughs> but I'm not sure that I'm at the same place today. Uh, I, I am, but I'm not. It, so <clears throat> I, I'm going to go back to another movie scene analogy. Uh, I love those. I, I, I think this... I think this is a recent movie. At your age, you, it was probably before you were born. But it was a remake of the old series, The Fugitive. Uh, I, don't th I don't think I have seen that. Did, did that, get, did that uh, make it to Mexico's? Uh, probably not. So <laughs> here's the background story. There was this doctor and uh, his family was murdered. And he was pinned with the murder. Um, 
And it turns out the reality that the audience knew was that the doctor didn't murder his family. Another uh, man had come in to the house and done it. So, but the doctor escaped from prison and his goal was to try to find the man that murdered his family. So they remade it. Uh, it, it, it was a very popular movie. It created a, a new uh, series with Tommy Lee Jones because he was a, the U.S. Marshal that was chasing the fugitive and Harrison Ford was the fugitive. Now, some of the boomers on this show have seen this, probably a lot of them. And you may, if you have, you'd remember this scene. So Harrison Ford escapes. Uh, he's in this huge drain. There's water flying everywhere. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones finds out about it. He's chasing him. Something happens, and Harrison Ford ends up with the gun. He's holding the gun on Tommy Lee Jones, and he says, I didn't do it. And Tommy Lee Jones's response was, I don't care. And it was like totally, total surprise. Why would, I mean, why would he say that? And here was the point. Tommy Lee Jones was saying, look, whether you actually did it or not, whether you're guilty or innocent is not my job. It's not what I do. I, my job is to make sure that we that you're brought in for trial. He wasn't saying that he didn't care about Harrison Ford. He was he was seeing things in terms of his job. And here's the thing. In terms of my job, I have to say I don't really care whether you get a stint for this or not. What I do care is that you don't give up on the things that we know yes. will work. Definitely. And the things that we know will work are lifestyle improvement, managing your weight, managing your diet, managing your sleep, managing your exercise, getting to managing your stress, getting to a healthy lifestyle. Uh, it can be supported with medications. Whether or not you get a stent, that's going to end up being your choice. If you want us to give you opinions, we can certainly do that. Sounds wonderful. Um. At some moment, I was feeling pretty strongly about a stand because of the chest pain. I have never experienced a chest pain like that. So I don't know how bad does that personally feels. Uh, even at my young age, I have had plenty of experience in the emergency room as you did, Dr. Brewer. So I've seen a lot of patients with heart attacks on the ER. And it's terrible. I mean, those people, if you want to have an image of somebody that's dying, you have to see somebody with a heart attack. It's terrible. So patients who have angina can feel that uh, anxiety and fear of death. And I can't understand wanting to rush to do whatever it takes to, to stay alive. So in this study, they included almost 300 patients who had total coronary occlusion and chest pain. Um, they did a randomization to put a stand on them. And they saw that short-term chest pain relief was present in both groups. Both those who had the stand and those who had it didn't have it. But long-term chest pain relief was only present on those who got a successful stent. So these are two groups. One, both of them had a stent. I'm sorry, both of them had the stent, but on one of them, the, the stent was placed correctly, and the other one, the stent didn't work or wasn't placed correctly. So if you're thinking about that vessel that is completely occluded, putting a stent directly on, on it, and especially if, it, if that is calcified black, that can be very challenging. The, the material they use might not be able to break through that calcified plaque and be placed on it because it's just hard plaque. But those who were able, on those who were, they were able to put a stain on that, they had that relief on pain for the long term. Um, those where the, the stent failed or wasn't placed properly, they didn't have that benefit. And see this, there was no difference in all cause of death. 
there were higher rates of cardiovascular events and needs for revascularization in the unsuccessful stent group. So if you go ahead, get a stent, and they fail, you're actually increasing your cardiovascular risk because that failed the stent. And they might need to get you on it again. And I think we saw a patient recently with this exact issue. They found a 70% blockage on their LAD. They put a stand on it. And then they say, oh, I think the problem is not fixed yet. We need to get you back in and put you another stand. And I love, you know, you love this. I know you love this next trials. Those are, this is very important information we reference every time. Uh, this is not people with 100% occlusion. I have to make that point. This is people who had some occlusion and they wanted to know if a stent decreased the risk of heart attack or no. So the COURAGE trial, they included uh, around 2,287 2, patients with chest pain and heart disease. And they randomized them into a one group with stents, another group, no stent, only medical therapy. And they followed them up uh, for up to seven years. There was no significant differences in death, heart attacks, strokes, hospitalizations for heart attacks. So the conclusion is a stent did not reduce the, the risk of cardiovascular events. So that's the COURAGE trial on the New England Journal of Medicine. On the Lancet in 2017, the Orbital trial included 230 patients with chest pain. Uh, half of them, almost half of them had a stent and the mean obstruction was 84.4%. So this were, was people with a lot of plaque, probably a lot of calcified plaque then there was no significant differences in exercise time beyond the effect of placebo, meaning if they had chest pain while exercising or not. There was no differences in chest pain relief. There was no differences in deaths. So there, there were, nobody died because of this. And there was no difference in heart attacks either. So another point to say, stents did not prevent heart attacks. And the next one is the ischemia trial on the New England Journal, 5,000 patients with a stable coronary disease, meaning they could have chest pain when exercising and moderate or severe ischemia. After 3.2 years of follow-up, there was no evidence that initial invasive strategy as stents or bypass grafts compared to medical treatment reduced heart attacks, death, or death for any other cause. So, Three trials, no benefits for stents on preventing heart attacks. I, I'll, I'll yield for you, Dr. Brewer. I take in just too much of the, of the stage right now. I, I don't know what I could add to that. Oh, wait a minute. I, <laughs> you know, I, I know you, I, I know you have something. I can always add, you know, uh, anybody remember big Russ, Tim Russert? I mean, the day after the day he died, his doctor and he's, he's a good doc. He actually referred. He appeared on TV. They asked him to talk about Tim Russert's death. And Tim Russert, if you don't remember, he was the well-known newsman. Uh, always confused the show that he ran. It was he was the longest running, like fifteen years on it. It was either Meet the Press or Face the Nation. And I see Jesus checking it out. He'll tell us in a minute. And I don't know why I always confuse those two, but he uh, he was a, a big runner. He had a he started to have some problems with his blood pressure and um, his weight. He had always had some problems with his weight, but he was a big runner. And he had he went to see his doc. He said, I'm having some problems. Can we make sure that I'm not going to have a heart attack? We did a stress test. He passed it with flying colors. Um, a couple of months later was doing a show killed over dead. You know, his producer walked in and he looked up at his producer and said, what's happening? And then just died. They did an autopsy and, um, the, 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 uh, the pathologist who did the autopsy said the inside of his coronary arteries looked like the pimply, the face of a teenager with a bad case of pimples. And those pimples were popping and releasing 
soft plaque into the artery, into the bloodstream. The soft plaque was causing clots. The, one of the clots hit his heart uh, through through his tissue into V-fib and killed him. Now, <clears throat> they because he was such a well-known public figure, they had his doctor appear on the case and his doctor quoted this trial. He said, the Courage trial has showed that stents don't prevent heart attacks. He knew it even then. Since then, there have been two other studies. The Orbita trial was done in the UK because it could never be done in the US. Everybody felt still so strongly that heart, that heart attacks were prevented by stents. The human subjects review boards would not agree to this Orbita trial. What they did was they took people that were, uh, that were supposed to have stents and they randomized them. They said, this group are gonna get stents. This group are gonna go into the OR just like they're gonna have a stent. They're gonna get prepped. They're gonna be put to sleep, just all just like they have a stent, except it's a sham procedure. They're not even doing the actual procedure. And guess what? <clears throat> they came out. They didn't have an, uh, uh, the control, the control group, uh, that had the stents had what you'd expect with stents, which is maybe some engine or relief. Uh, maybe not so much. The, um, no improvement in, um, in survival and the experimental group that had the sham procedure did not have the stent had the exact same experience as the people that had the stent. So it, be, it's, it became clearer and clearer that stents don't prevent heart attacks. 90% of stents are done to prevent heart attacks. Now there's a 10% of stents that are life-saving. That's when you're in the middle of a heart attack and they can get a stent in and bypass that heart attack and, and, or go around. Let me not use that term bypass because it'll confuse things yet again as if we hadn't had enough confusion. So you would think, okay, this evidence showing that stents don't prevent heart attacks, you would think that the medical community, you'd think that we'd stop doing stents, except the ones that actually save lives, right? It did get the, the cardiology community's attention. They started seeing it. And guess what? The cardiothoracic surgeon said, aha, uh, it's bypass that fixes this, not stents. So what happened to the to the cardiology community that did they stop doing stents? No, they're doing no, they didn't. multiples more than they ever did. I hate to say it. It sounds cynical. It sounds like, but it's true. You know, they got mortgages to pay. There's it's hard for somebody to, to realize that what they do for a living is not helping people. So, <clears throat> but uh, they still got to make a living. The show is Meet the Press. Meet the, uh, press. meet the Press. Okay, thank you. And I'll forget it promptly, forget it again. So you'll yeah. have to be there. Anyway, so the, the thoracic surgeons said, aha, we've got it. And everybody's going to have to start getting bypass grafts now, right? Then along came the ischemia trial. They did this same basic studies, set of studies with where they're looking at maybe bypass graft is going to prevent heart attacks and strokes. And the results were no, they didn't. So guess what? You know, like Tommy Lee Jones said, I, in many ways, professionally, I don't care whether you try the surgical procedures, just don't rely on them to save you. You're, it's up to you. You've got to do the lifestyle changes. Um, got a little bit passionate, but thank you for giving me that opportunity. Definitely. This is, this is core information. When, when Dr. Bird says stress tests don't predict heart attacks, stents do not prevent heart attacks. Bypass grafts do not prevent heart attacks. This is the evidence we're quoting every time. Uh, 
Now, what does prevent or detect a heart attack? So we wanted to present this one as well because it, it's been a while since we covered the Honda study. Dr. Brewer covered the Honda study a while back. We want to go back to it because we have a lot of people saying, well, I understand that the CIMT, the carotid intima media thickness test, will detect soft plug on my neck. That's not my heart. So how sure you are that if I plug on my neck, that, that actually means that I have plaque on my heart. So uh, the Hunter study, this was made on the, published on the atherosclerosis journal 2004. And the first image that I wanted to show you is this one. This is what soft plaque looks like on an ultrasound machine while doing a CIMT. That's to your left. And to your right, you have what calcified plaque looks like. And if you see on the very bottom, it has a number that says EIMT, what is the intima media thickness? How much, uh, that's on millimeters usually, how much? How many millimeters uh, are uh, off plaque on that specific vessel? Both of them have 2.3. So the number is not enough. You have to know, okay, 2.3, what type of plaque? So the left one, which is apparently more soft than calcified, is way more dangerous than the 2.3 on the right side, which is basically calcified plaque. So that's that's what it looked like, looks like on this on the CIMT. And then we had a lot of lengthy discussion about this this uh, graphic right there, that's a Kap Kaplan Meyer curve. That if I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a shot to explain it. So. Imagine that you have two two you have you're on a race and you have two teams, one on your left, one on your right, or you want to see it that way, one on the top, one at the at the bottom. They are starting on the same line on day zero. Both groups had a CIMT, and we have one group that has soft black, which is uh, what it says echolucent carotid plaques, that means soft plaque. And the other team is a team that has no, has not any soft plaque. And you want to see which one of those two groups make it to the end. So yeah. let me go back and interrupt just a second. Sure. The team with the soft plaque is the guys on the left. Yeah. The team without the soft plaque is the guys with the, the calcified plaque on the right. Yes. Okay. So if if this doesn't if 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 you expected that this doesn't matter or shouldn't matter, you will expect to see what you see on the top dot line for both groups. You will see both of them staying on the race. Nobody died. Nobody had the burn. No, nobody had the bends. Nobody had heart attacks. But the reality is the dotted line on the top is the people who had no soft plaque, only calcified plaque, the people on the right side. Not many people had events. And if you see the other line, the one that is not dotted, which is a more uh, black line, this is people that had soft plaque on it, the left side team, and as, as time, time went by, a lot of them had cardiac events or, or, or deaths. And they didn't have, at least at this point, they didn't have a calcium score. They didn't have a CT angiogram. This was solely based on the CIMT results. And the, the, the explanation is cardiovascular inflammation, plaque is a systemic issue. If you have plaque on your carotid arteries, expect to have plaque on your coronary arteries. And it doesn't necessarily have to be on all the vessels. We have seen calcium scores and CT angiograms that show plaque only on the LAD and the other ones don't seem to have that much. Still expect that if you have on your carotid arteries, you're gonna have on your coronaries. 
there is something going on in there and that's something it's cardiovascular inflammation. It sounds like you've got a freight train in your living room. Yeah, I have to stop. <laughs> so, you know, I uh, actually pushed the button and tried to do, and I caused that freight train to come by because I wanted to talk a little bit. That's not true. I'm just giving you a hard time. I think you did a great job describing that. Now, for those of you who have asked the question, I've, I've heard it a lot. Brewer, you keep saying that calcified plaque is stable. What is that based on? That's based on these studies. The, um, this one is one of the key studies. We, as Jesus said, we've covered it before. Uh, we're covering it again. What this shows is this is not uh, subjective. Yes, you can subjectively look and tell there's more calcium in, on the, the image on the right than there is on the image of the left. The left is softer plaque. It's got some tiny flecks, but it's really soft plaque. The image on the right is stabilized plaque. The image on the left wouldn't even uh, qualify as heterogeneous plaque. It's soft plaque. They followed these two groups using a thing that was developed for insurance companies. It's called a... Uh, Oh, I'm blanking on it now. It's Kaplan a Kaplan-Meier curve. Yeah, Kaplan-Meier life table curve. What what they do is they say, okay, like Jesus said, you start with the two populations. Every time there's an event in a life table, for example, that would be a death. There's a drop in the curve. So the way to look at this, then you can tell is, it looks like at month one, there were what. There were what a total of six death or six events in the in the uh, calcified plaque group was that right? Four. Four? Four, events. Four events. Okay, so three of them happened in that first month. It looks like one other happened at about six months. Six, well, yeah, maybe six months, and then there were no others. They were stable. They did not have events. Uh, uh, Miranda, the, the vegan doctor, challenged me yesterday when we were going over this and said, so really the evidence is saying that you only get a 60% improvement in stability when you get calcified plaque. No, that was a misreading of the previous study. And we'll talk about that again later. But no, as you go through this and you look at it, it's really clear. 90% at least improvement in stability when you calcify that plaque. And this is not the only study, but this is one of the most dramatically uh, obvious studies when you look at the data in terms of saying, calcify that, I mean, uh, change your lifestyle, lose the weight, get the, do the right things, and it's going to result in calcification of that plaque. And yes, when you do calcify your soft plaque, you are going to take that risk for heart attack and stroke off the table. So I think my, um, as you will, as you often say, when the meese are away, the, the cats will play. And, <laughs> and I think the freight train has, uh, has gone away. So you, the meese are coming back and I'll have to be quiet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, this is the last slide that we have for the show and everybody can say, ah, oh, it was, it, this was a really good show. I fairly enjoyed it. I was concerned about the Q&A, but I'm glad that you went ahead and started popping questions up as we moved on because uh, I didn't see questions from YouTube members uh, until now, but those are really good questions. And we knew this was going to be a long show. And I'm glad that we address questions as we move on. Uh, this last slide is showing two things. Uh, the left side table says patients with uh, soft plaque, they, from 112, we had 29 events. 17 of them have unstable angina. If you remember that, that's chest pain that doesn't resolve with resting. 11 had a stent. Three had a, a bypass. Only five followed with medical treatment alone. Six had uh, re recurrent angina, meaning still had chest pain. 
and uh, four of them ended up in invasive therapy and other stuff. From the people who did not have soft plaque and had only calcified plaque, there were only four events, no deaths, compared to the other one where four people died. In this one, four people had events out of uh, 103. Two of them uh, were, uh, one of them was a non-fatal heart attack, only one. One people had a st unstable angina. Only two went through a stance. And two of them had developed recurrent angina symptoms, which I now think might have been the same people who had the stent. I will need to verify that. But we saw how an unsuccessful stent can end up on recurrent chest pain. And if you see the table to the right, there's a bunch of numbers right there. But if there's one number I want you to pay attention to is where it says odds ratio and below that it's a seven. Presence of eclusent carotid plaque, meaning presence of soft plaque. That seven means if you have soft plaque in your CIMT, you have seven times more risk of developing a heart attack. That's what it means. Seven, that, that, seven that's to one is not 90%. It's way more. It's seven hundred more risk, right? Oh, like you're right. It's two, not two, two it's times not less than ninety percent. It's a lot, yeah. lot more. Yeah, yeah. Two times is the double the risk. So, so yeah. do uh, are we ready to get on with the show? Does this end our our uh, <clears throat> long form content for the day? Are we ready to get on with the rest of the show? Do you, I would love for you to give a brief uh, conclusion, some words that you want to bring out to the people who uh, are following the channel that's in the show on regards to this specific topic. I saw a lot of questions over here that says, well, what, I, what do I do about it? And if you want to revisit the show that we had last week with Daniel Trevor, and we had a previous show with Daniel Trevor about metabolic health. Uh, you'll find more information there about. Okay, now I understand. I hopefully we explain good enough to for you to understand the dangers behind soft black versus calcified black. And if you want to know the answer, what to do about it, you will find information on the YouTube channel. Of course, remember this is not medical advice. You you will need to see a physician. And I'm gonna do a segue for the physician before you give your closer closer remarks. Visit PrevMedHealth.com. Dr. Bruce seeing patients still. We have also a group of uh, nurse practitioners that are are very, very learning a lot and very quickly and are seeing patients already because they know this stuff real good already. Uh, so visit the website, PrevMedHealth.com, book an appointment. You're going to find more information in there. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge two things because I don't think we're going to go to Q&A today. Tired looking for name. Uh, Send us a super chat, $10. Thank you so much. It helps a lot. And Thurston Howell, thir the third, wouldn't a low dose of Libalo, one milligram per day, for example, be a greater, great risk reward? I don't I don't think I understand the question. What is a great risk reward? You know? uh, so basically he says, you know, what is the risk of taking Libalo? Oh. And what's the reward associated with it? So Libalo and... and uh, low dose resuvastatin or generic Crestor are the two statins that we tend to use. Uh, and yeah, if you have, if you have plaque, yes, we do recommend it. And it, it does have a great risk reward. You know, the American speaking of that topic, Thurston Howell, Howell the third, and I'm so tempted to go on a, on a down a bunny hole about Gilligan's Island, but I won't do it. <laughs> well, I just realized I, I thought you had a patient at um, in 15 minutes. So if unless you have something on your schedule right now, you can go on a rant. We love your rant. So <laughs> let's do this. Let's do this. If you're agreeing with me, <clears throat> don't lose your train of thought. Uh, Gilbert, uh, let's go to the Q&A. Answer that. Right, so statins, 
Stanton's, Stanton's rant? No, it's not going to be a rant. I, I, I will have to make this comment, though, Jesus. Um, and you know what, um, Gilbert, if you would go back to what was that? The first slide about the, uh, the event. A lot of people have tuned in late and they need to be aware and thinking about it. Um, I got you. So I'm not going to go on a rant. I do have to make a brief digression. You did that thing about uh, if you want to be a patient, come see us. You did that so well. I think you're going to get the video demonetized. You're starting to sound like a uh, a radio or media advertiser. You did. I told you. I, I've been hearing a lot of car talk recently, so <laughs> I'm learning stuff. Even even of, even about cars that I don't know anything about. I'm starting to learn things about cars as well. <laughs> So anyhow, the, the Thurston Howell III, and I won't go down the bunny hole about uh, about Gilligan's Island, but I will go down the bunny hole about statins. You know, the American um, Heart Association has, uh, I have to say it, I'm, I'd love to be bashful, but I'm not going to be. They caught up with this, sort of, uh, in terms of statins. They said, look, you know what? If you have a zero calcium score, in other words, if you don't have plaque, uh, you don't need a statin. Mm. Well, let's go back to before them saying that. They said we're basically saying you'd go through a Framingham if there's a significant increased risk for um, for cardiovascular uh, events. You, you put somebody on a statin. One of the key things that they were looking at was an elevated LDL. Well, guess what? You know, docs are busy. Life is complicated. You think your life is complicated, you know, or your profession may be complicated. You know, doctors have lives too, and their professions are very complicated. So they try to simplify whenever they can. Well, one of the ways they simplify is they say, well, you know, LDL is a big risk factor. So we've, we've seen it in a lot of studies. And yeah, some of that may have been, a lot of that may have been misinterpreted, but again, they just hone in on the LDL and they say, if LDL's high, give a statin. That's not exactly what the American Heart Association said either, but they never really said this thing about, if you don't have plaque, maybe you don't need a statin. And then probably you don't need a statin. Until about two or three years ago, they did, uh, they started saying that too. But even then, they didn't get it exactly right because they didn't, at that point in time, the standards committee had not really, they'd not had a chance to review this video, which obviously would have been impossible because that was three years ago and the video wasn't recorded yet. But it, it, go back and look at the dates on these studies. A lot of this information was already available then. It was available because we knew about it. And part of their problem was they were ignoring CIMT data. They were ignoring things like the Cafe de Caves. You know, Jesus, you said we got to cover that. Yeah, we do, because it's a landmark study in terms of CIMT, calcification, uh, plaque risk, et cetera. And this whole thing about, you know, you you have risk even if you're if you're you don't have enough plaque to to impact flow. And that's like the Princeton guys have said recent, more recently, in fact, three quarters of heart attacks occur in people that don't have an impact on flow. And you've already mentioned that in this show today. But anyhow, the Standards Committee was ignoring CIMTs to their discredit. But to their credit, they did look at calcium scores. And they said, look, if your calcium score is zero, and we're going to count that as the gold standard of whether you have plaque or not. If you, I mean, for having zero plaque. They said, if your calcium score is zero, you don't have to take a statin. Here's where they got that wrong. And again, if you've, if you've followed maybe even 60% of what we've covered today, you may be able to think through this and say, well, initial plaque is going to be soft plaque. And initially, you may have nothing but soft plaque. People that really get into this stuff and understand that were saying that as well. And sure enough, um, 
the study was done. And I covered that. What was it, two years ago? Maybe, yeah. Where they did a study on people that had a zero calcium score. And they showed, guess, did those people have, were, did any of those people have heart attacks? Nope. No, they did have a heart attack. That's the point. And, and pardon me for putting you on the spot, but at least I had to make. I think I misunderstood the question. I'm sorry. I was getting ready to say, I'm sure you misunderstood the question because I know you know the content. Um, and actually, it's a good thing. Maybe it, uh, Maybe I'm being unclear. What happened was this: the American Heart Association Standards Committee said, if you have a zero calcium score, you don't have to take statins. And their rationale was because you don't have plaque. Well, people that really understand plaque realize that that may not be entirely true. You may have only soft plaque and it may not have calcified yet. So be careful saying I have a I have zero calcium score, so I have no plaque, because you may have nothing but soft plaque. The bottom of the iceberg, just that yeah. your 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 iceberg tip is just very small right now. Exactly, and guess what? They did do that study, and guess what? There were people having heart attacks with a zero calcium score. So, you know, that's obviously major evidence to look at something else like a CIMT. And then I'm not going to go down that whole bunny hole of CIMT versus CTA or whatever. But the point was, if you have plaque, if you have plaque, you probably need to be on some other stuff to help. And that's where you get into the point about statins. That's when we recommend statins. We recommend low-dose statins, not high-dose statins. And this whole concept about um, statins for low dose, uh, low dose statins for uh, for plaque came up. We didn't come up with this. A couple of smart guys at Harvard came up with it 10 years ago. At this point, maybe closer to 20, uh, Gavin Blake and Paul Ridker. They said, look, if you look at the a lot of these studies, people that are taking statins, even if they have low uh, cholesterol, are not having uh, um, heart attacks. Even if they have high cholesterol and they're taking a statin, they're not having a heart attack. Even if they're, uh, it doesn't really seem to matter so much where their cholesterol is. Uh, if they're on a statin, they're not, they're less likely to have a heart attack. Maybe it's not LDL, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's inflammation. So I think as I tried to make this clearer, I might have made it more confusing. Um, oh, well, I tried. <laughs> so uh, what does the bird try to say? <laughs> <laughs> I, now I pulled the reverse card on you. No, I just, I mean, I, I think you have, you have mentioned this several times. Statins help. They have multiple anti-inflammatory cardiovascular inflammation benefits. They do have risks. Uh, the side effects are can be painful, but that's usually on higher dose. Very, very few patients have side effects on very low dose of statins. So they are not the landmark of the central piece of the treatment and prevention, but they do help. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I, I want to cover at least two or three comments before we, we leave. Uh, black tengu, I'm still confusing the issue of saturated fat. For example, in dairy, for those of us who have plaque, should we avoid it? And what percentage of people with carotid plaque have coronary plaque? Two good questions. Um, on saturated fats, uh, we always refer to Nina Teichel's book, The Big Fat Surprise. Take a look at that. Uh, it seems that it is not, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't have a protective factor, but it's not as bad as people might think. It's been um, satanized, if, I, if that's the word. Like people like to beat up on saturated fat oh. from the 70s and say that it's just too bad, too bad. It's going to cause a heart attack, et cetera, et cetera. Demonized. Demonized, yeah. I, I was gonna say demonetized, but that's what what I just did with this video. <laughs> that's what you just did with our video. <laughs> so, uh, 
So it, it, research, it, it seems that it's not that bad as we thought it was. I, I, I still think that being an occupational medicine doctor as well, uh, having too much of something still has some pose some dangers. But even the American Heart Association has said that total total dietary cholesterol, the intake of cholesterol that you eat, is not as impactful as other stuff. And we have proven time and time again how it's actually high amount of carbs and processed foods and fructose on those and other stuff that is way more dangerous than saturated fats. Percentage of people with carotid plaque that have coronary plaque, more than 90%. I'll have to verify the number where that came from. Uh, I think the Cafe de Capes mm -hmm. study provides some information regarding that as well. I can give you a little bit of clarification. It's about 98%. Mm -hmm. So um, and I'm, I wanted to address this because I'm sorry, Doctor. Do you want to show another one? I was showing this one from Peggy because she said you had to remember. Uh, uh, I know that she's this person's not a, a member, and I know you're going to get mad at me for presenting it, but I got put, put my image over there, Gilbert. That can I'm, show my emotions right now instead of what I'm showing. <laughs> actually, I, I'm going to pull my card here because <laughs> I think this helps other people uh, understand this issue a whole lot and managing their own yeah. risk. So if you have low inflammation, but hard plaque, you don't need statins, right? On an immediate basis, no, you don't. But here's the problem. Did you feel it when you got soft plaque before? Did you know it when you got soft plaque before? And the answer is always going to be no, I didn't. So the statins are, uh, do you, uh, your body's already proven it's going down that, it can go down that path and you're not going to notice it. So this is a safety valve. If you say, you know what, I don't want to go with a safety valve, then, you know, that's your choice. But that's that's what it is. So a really good question, Leslie. Thank you for asking it. And Ms., uh, Dr. Jesus, uh, Mr. Uh, tough on the on the no no answer for you guy. Go ahead back and take yeah. it again. Yeah, exactly. No, I, it, it's nothing against people who are not YouTube members. We're just trying to advocate to become a YouTube member. It's going to help a challenge, uh, the channel a lot. And this is an atypical show because we usually try to accommodate on those who are due to members first. So recently learned of another former ER doc doing preventive medicine fo with focus on reading visceral fat via lifestyle as seen on the VIT. The VIT is a visceral adipose tissue on the MRI. Interesting, but as a CIMT, hard to access. Check out Dr. Sean O'Mara. Uh, it's interesting. It's a, we, we have had our discussions about how do you mes measure uh, visceral fat? Because that, that drives a lot of hormones that have to do with hunger and it drives insulin resistance as well. Insulin resistance will, it, it's a kind of a vicious cycle where insulin resistance creates uh, an issue where, where the body is not able to burn fat, then you storage fat. And the fat that you storage creates more insulin resistance, drives more insulin resistance. So it, it's a good follow-up uh, to make sure that you don't have that much visceral fat. So that's important. No gazpacho for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of uh, the, 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 what, what it's like. It's, it's, uh, it's more like art from Argentina, I believe, or Spain. Yeah, Spain, oh, yeah. and I'm yeah. I'm reminded of that Spanish. Uh, I'm not gonna go down that path, uh, <clears throat> but it was a really it's a really good point. Sean Amara really has focused on um, sprinting as part of the high intensity interval stuff, and that's what I do. I do hill sprints uh, usually on a used to do them almost all on a treadmill. More recently, I'm doing them outdoors, and. Hill sprints are really, really good forms of high intensity interval work. Uh, Jesus, you're right. I am getting uh, long in the tooth in terms of I got to get ready to see some patients. Any closing remarks before we go? Uh, yes. Uh, to the to the group out there that's hung in with us. It's been a hard it's been a hard one to follow today. We got really, really geeky. Uh, but a lot of folks stuck in there and not only did they stick in there, the audience has grown showing that there was a lot of interest. Um, thank you for your interest.
See you next week.